I've never witnessed anything like this. My breath catches in my throat. Awe, joy, grief swirl in a dizzying dance. It's the greatest magic I've ever seen. His finest show, his final show. But before we hear that story, we need to go back to the beginning where the story of Neville began to a world and time so different. There's a Bible verse that talks about Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God. And Paul, reflecting on him, says he was without father, without mother. Now consider how great this man was. Neville's story is not too dissimilar. Neville Blurt, well, we're unsure of what his surname is, his father's unknown. He could be Jones, De Beer, or something else. Was born the year World War II began, on the 2nd of February 1939, in Marin Hill Monastery in Pinetown. Neville's early years were around the Durban Harbour and late on the Brea with his mom Doreen. Being raised by one parent meant that toys were a luxury he seldom received. The early years were the war years when Neville would join long queues in Smith Street in order to exchange coupons for basic food rations. These were scary and crazy times. From the lack of food and the fear, to rushing around at night to quickly close curtains and, and turn off lights as the sirens went and planes flew overhead. To seeing truckloads of Italian prisoners of war being taken off to the various work areas around the Tell. To the excitement of being able to go on board a captured German submarine that had surrendered at Durban Harbour. To finally being part of the huge celebration at Albert Park when the war was finally over in 1945. He was only six. Soon his school years began, just as the war ended. Never went to Glenwood Junior Primary and then Parkview Senior Primary in Bulwer Road until Grade 8. His height and physique made him the fastest in the 100 metres, while his captivating personality made him the obvious choice for captain of his schoolhouse, Norton, and a prefect. However, just like his early years, his school years were different. One of his greatest joys were his bicycle adventures. He would often be given a school pass to leave school and would then ride off on his bicycle to the Barclays Bank and Brea Road to deposit the school funds. Here was a young 12-year-old boy riding off to deposit the school's hoard of cash. Not only would he do regular trips to the bank for the school, but on one occasion, he was asked to ride all the way down to Addington Senior Primary School to hand out some survey forms, a distance of about 10 kilometers. Obviously, such a long trip necessitated a stopover at home for lunch, and finally returned to school at the end of the day. However, there were the times when he got into trouble. One occasion was when he got into trouble with a teacher by the appropriate and ominous name of Mr. Bullymore. Now, the punishment meted out in those days was to stand outside the classroom. The problem was that if you were spotted by the headmaster standing outside the classroom, then the wrath of the cane would come upon your rear end. However, if you were lucky enough not to be spotted, then you would get off unscathed. However, on this occasion, Neville and his friend Vincent were caught by the headmaster and marched off to his office. After a sound beating being administered to both of them, the headmaster left them in his office while he went off to speak to the teacher. Vincent, he was a bit crazy, says Neville, recalling the story, then broke all the headmaster's canes while he was away. Fortunately, Vincent admitted to it, so sparing Neville from the further consequences that obviously arose. Neville was the youngest and probably still holds the record for being the youngest person to drive a car at senior primary school. He would often borrow his mom's car and drive to school. In fact, he had been driving for many years before he turned 18, and when he went for his license, the inspector wanted to know how long he had been driving. While Neville's life had adventures, it was not easy. During his school years, his mother gave up Neville to be adopted by her stepdad. He would now grow up in his new family, and this would not be easy. It would literally be the Cinderella story. He would experience the cruelty of being unloved and disregarded. When the family left for Christmas holidays, he would be left behind. When gifts were given, he would receive none. And then at the age of just 15, he was forced to leave school and get a job. He went to work at W.F. Johnson, but he continued to study from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. at night school. He wanted to get qualified, and so he was studying how to be a wood machinist. However, 
After witnessing someone chop their fingers off, he decided to focus rather on the saw and not the wood. He studied for five years to become a saw doctor. His salary was 75 shillings, about a rand a week. And as soon as he returned home with this money, his stepdad would take it all. His payment for being allowed to live with him. One of the challenges Neville had was working all day and then having to study at night. The real challenge was on the night when all his mates were heading to the cinema to watch a movie. One night it was raining, so Neville devised an ingenious plan. He purposely made sure he got totally drenched on his way to college, knowing he would be sent home, which would allow him time to head off to the movies with his friends. However, much to his horror, the lecturer sent him home with the instruction that he return back to the lecture. And so after getting wet, trudging all the way home, getting changed, he finally arrived back at the lecture as it was finishing. Neville was an amazing ice skater and played ice hockey for the Eagles in Durban, back in the day when there was a full-sized ice rink in Durban. He also played first division table tennis for a Dutch club called Effect. However, the ice hockey ended when he landed up in hospital with a concussion. He also entered an ice skating marathon. He skated for three days and two nights non-stop, besides the allowed 10 minute break per hour. And during his final break, he was interviewed by a radio station and when the hooter went to call them back onto the ice, he did not have time to tighten his boots that he had loosened. And so his ankles started to swell and he had to quit. However, he had achieved an amazing third place out of a starting lineup of over 200 people. He recalls the endless skating we would entertain ourselves during the ice skating with reading books or even playing chess against one another. Because of his size, Neville was often a bouncer at clubs and other places. His goal was always to look out for people. His younger cousin Barry recalls how often he would come to his rescue when someone picked on him. On one occasion, a burly chap was worrying a girl at a party. Neville told him to leave her alone. Barry recalls, the big guy then said, what are you going to do about it? Well, he soon found out as Neville physically picked him up and tossed him over the fence. Moments later, the guy stormed back, shouting, You will regret doing that! Only to find himself thrown back over the fence again. He never returned. Everything would change in 1958 at the age of 19. One of Neville's friends, Richard, whose dad owned a garage and had some money, organised to pick up a whole group of girls and all head down to the beach. On the way down to the beach, they stopped to pick up a young, beautiful looking girl called Anne. There were so many in the car that at that stage, Neville decided with a mate of his to jump into the boot for the remainder of the trip. After picking up some nurses from Addington Hospital, they headed to Blue Lagoon, the cool place to hang out. Finally being freed from the boot, Neville got his first real look at Anne. Wow, he thought. She can't be more than 12 or 13 years of age, and she's hanging out with us. Well, as it turned out, she was 17. And so started the romance, which would continue from then until they were married on 18 December 1964. And soon came the batch of kids with Craig born in 1966, followed by Stephen in 1968 and Matthew in 1970. Things were quite different back then. Never records. I, I remember pushing Craig in a pram at night in West Street while we were window shopping. The early years were spent at a flat in Bishop's Gate in Smith Street, and then later on in Russell Mansions in Russell Street. And finally they bought some land in Pinetown, where Neville owner built their first house. When, when the kids were small, we used to go and pick up two kids from a shelter home every week, Neville said. It was a home for children who had been abandoned by their parents. These two children were the only two who were never picked up by anyone, and so we would pick them up. However, we started to get very attached to them and were then warned by the home that the kids' parents were around and that we must be careful of this attachment as they could not be adopted. And so we had to try and reduce our time with them. The magic was now everywhere. Neville's life training was preparing the greatest magician ever, one who would bring awe and joy and love to everyone. After graduation, Neville decided the fun thing to do would be to join the Rhodesian army. It sounded like it would be quite an adventure. And there was the promise of being able to see the world. 
after spending one month in the army, he realized that the prospect of touring the world was highly unlikely. Also, he could not realize his dream of being a paratrooper. You know, South Africans were given positions that kept them near South Africa. So, after one month, he decided this was not what he wanted, and he gave his rifle and kit to his cousin, who was also in the army, instructing him to hand it back to them when the officer returned. However, his cousin promptly forgot all about the kit in his locker. Before returning home, Neville went and stayed for a while in Bulawaya, and then finally hitchhiked all the way back to Durban. It was not easy, he recalls, as there were no proper roads. Most of the time, there were just two concrete strips for the cars to drive on. By the time he returned back home several weeks later, he was a wanted man. Police from several countries were looking for an armed AWOL soldier. It took a bit of quick explaining to avoid arrest. Neville then got a job at Lion Match Factory as a saw doctor, and then was asked to open a business for Jimmy Cock and Durban. He did this and ran the business for five years. He was then approached by saw specialists to come and work for them, which he did while continuing to work for Lion Match Factory at night. This proved quite tiring, and after four years, he decided to open his own business, Pine Saw. He had this business for over 20 years, and finally sold it, when he was approached by an investor. He stayed on for a while as the manager and then left and spent a while trying his skills as an estate agent. And then finally in 2002, he joined Uniskill where he worked as a manager and in various other capacities until he retired in August 2007. However, even at 81 years of age, his old saw sharpening business was begging him to come back and work to train people, even if it was just for a few days. And Neville would do this from time to time. His magic touch, transforming lives. However, the real magic was in none of these things. It would be found in something he had never known about, and something he did not even like. Neville was quite anti-church growing up. He really enjoyed his soccer, but was not keen on church, because soccer was on a Sunday at the same time as church. It was amazing, he recalls. But after I was baptized in 1964, soccer moved from being at the same time as church to afternoons on Sunday, and then to Saturday. It just shows that sometimes we have to show what is most important before God will help out. And this was something Neville would do for the rest of his life. God first. Neville and Anne then moved to the church in Pinetown, where they met in the Scout Hall at Lai Park. Later, he helped build their own church hall in Sunnyside Lane, now somewhere under the Salem Centre in Pinetown. And then they joined the church in Durban and later helped establish a new light stand in Bethel Westville, a place where Neville could really share his magic. He didn't enjoy standing up and speaking, but he would nonetheless happily share a Bible message of hope and encouragement. However, his greatest gift was always being there, always greeting people, keeping a register of who attended for years and years so he could be aware of who was missing and reach out and find them. Up until the last Sunday he attended, he was the one, as he often was, to hand the bread and wine around, his large, comforting hands no longer steady, his breath coming in gasp, yet serving, caring, loving was his calling, his Lord's commission, his life. The love of his life, Anne, died in September 2016, after 52 years of marriage. She was his rock, his love, his everything, a shattering loss. She had given him a family, natural and spiritual. She had given him meaning. She had showed him how he could really do magic, really touch lives. In his grief, his love shone brighter still. From going weekly to her graveside to read his Bible aloud, to now multiplying his love and generosity even more, His time was filled with helping everyone he could find. The oldies, as he called the older gang that he helped, taking them on holidays and adventures. The younger ones who needed wise advice or practical help. Strangers who needed joy. Long lost relatives who needed care. His love just poured out. Then in 2020, the COVID crisis hit the world. It was unprecedented. It was the third world war, but not the one we expected. This one would devastate the entire planet. This time, the enemy unseen, panic, fear, trauma, loss everywhere. And in the storm, Neville lived life like he did in the war that he had arrived in. Caring, 
loving, unafraid. And as he said, my name is written in God's book of life. He knows everything. And so he continued to love and care with unfettered abandon. All his life, Neville loved to do magic. He just loved the looks of wonder and awe on kids' faces when something vanished or, or appeared. However, he would always say at the end, there's no such thing as magic. It's just a trick. The real magic is the miracles God does. His magic wasn't just the vanishing coin. It was far greater than that. It was the magical sweetie that appeared for every child he met. It was the dog biscuit treats for expectant grand dogs. It was the money slipped into a petrol attendant's hand. It was his unexpected appearance to bring someone in need on a fun outing. It was the smile he magically made appear on an unnoticed cashier. It was his endless, impartial, selfless outpouring of joy and kindness. As if by magic, wherever he had been, there bloomed joy, peace and love. And he was right. This was not magic. It was something far greater. It was God's divine love, a love beyond human reason, a love that takes an orphan and makes him care for orphans, a love that takes a rebel and makes him help rebels, a love that takes one who had nothing and causes him to give everything. With what shall I sharpen it, dear Liza, dear Liza? With what shall I sharpen it, dear Liza? With what? With a stone, dear Henry, dear Henry, dear Henry. With a stone, dear Henry, dear Henry. With a stone. But my stone is too dry, dear Liza, dear Liza. But my stone is too dry. I end up with a stiff neck. <laughs> no, you can adjust. <laughs> you can adjust that. How do you want? <laughs> okay, how's that? This will be the latest trend. <laughs> this will be ideal. <laughs> this is ideal for Elvin Hughes to come here. Right? You put it on Elvin. <laughs> So I stand at his bedside. The noise of oxygen being forced in his lung makes it hard to hear him. Hours earlier we had received the call. He needs to go on a ventilator to have any chance of survival. Of course we agreed. This is what must happen. Yet soon we get another call from the hospital. It's the doctor calling from next to his bed. He won't accept the ventilator. He says we must give it to someone else. He's fully aware of what he's saying. What do you want us to do? I'm in shock. Afraid. The doctor continues. It is amazing he has the ventilator, especially at his age and with his comorbidities. There's a 30 year old who needs it and five others. If we take it from him now, it'll not come back. What do you want us to do? Pain, fear, despair. Dad, kindness, love. That's dad. Give the ventilator to someone else. By another miracle, we'll give an entry to the heart of the war. We stand in high care. Nurses helping the dying, monitors beeping, breathing machines hissing. A nurse stops by and says, he's such an amazing man. I told him his nose was blue. He said, of course it is. I'm a bluet. His magic's still at work. Dad looks at us. He immediately points to the drawer next to his bed and gasps, saying, my wallet. I get it. He points at the card. Take the money. Give it to everyone who needs. Take my car. And then as he gains strength, he asks after everyone. He prays for God's blessing on all the sick. He gives thanks for everyone in his life. He squeezes the oxygen mask to give himself more air. And then he says, It's such an awesome God. He can't get any better. And I give all praise to him. And I give God thanks for all of you. Praise be to God. Oh. A dying man gasping for breath, looking with love and compassion on those around him. I've been blessed to see Jesus living, loving and real in Dad. My breath catches in my throat. A lesson of love shown to us, a lesson of love we must now live. 
without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abides a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was.